Hello, nephew community. My name is Sean George, medical science liaison with Otsuka Pharmaceutical Development and Commercialization. I am here with Dr. Ben Cowley to discuss how the diagnosis of polycystic kidney disease is made. Dr. Ben Cowley is the Section Chief of Nephrology in the Department of Medicine at the University of Oklahoma Health Science Center, and he is also the John Gamble Professor in Polycystic Kidney Disease. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I've been asked to discuss uh, making a diagnosis of polycystic kidney disease, and I probably should start by saying the patients I see may not be typical. Um, I'm in a referral center um, and have some expertise in polycystic kidney disease. So many, if not most, of the patients I see have already seen other physicians and frequently other nephrologists and are coming to see me um, not only to confirm a diagnosis but to learn more about their disease. Um, the vast majority of patients I see um, will have a family history. Um, they'll either have uh, know about parents or siblings or other relatives that have PKD and that's probably typical. I think the vast majority of patients with polycystic kidney disease do have a family history, although not all of them do. Um, confirming a diagnosis is typically done with imaging, um, either sonography, CT, or MRI. Um, and sort of the criteria are somewhat different simply because the sensitivity of those imaging techniques vary somewhat. Um, the issue is in normal individuals who do not have polycystic kidney disease, as individuals grow older, there's an increase in frequency of simple cysts in the kidneys, which are really of no clinical consequence. So in a young individual, you wouldn't expect to see simple cysts, so a few cysts in each kidney would be very suggestive of a diagnosis of PKD, whereas in an older individual, in which simple cysts can occur at you know, fairly frequent, uh, on a fairly frequent basis, you'd want to see a larger number of cysts to confirm a diagnosis of hereditary PKD. That's been formalized in a couple of different ways. Uh, York Pay and David Ravine um, in the early 2000s uh, formalized criteria for sonography uh, and, and looking at the number of cysts that you'd want to be uh, present to be confident of a diagnosis in an, event, in, an in an individual who has a family history. And that family history issue is important. We'll come back to that in a moment. Um, more recently, York has uh, formalized criteria with MRI imaging, um, and MRI is really more sensitive uh, than sonography in terms of detecting cysts, and it's really replacing, to some extent, sonography as the imaging modality of choice, uh, to some extent because we can get volumes from MRIs, and that has prognostic significance. But the family history is important. In an indi individual who has a family history, presumably they have a 50-50 chance of inheriting the abnormal gene from one of their parents. And so the prior probability of the disease being present is 50%. And so the criteria that, that York has defined with MRI um, mainly uh, address that issue of someone with a family history. In an, in an individual who doesn't have a family history, um, the odds are much lower. I mean, they're going to have a much lower probability of inheriting a gene since they don't have a family history. Most of those patients probably have a new mutation, also, although some of them may simply not know about their family history. And, you know, some of them, there may be a family history of which they're unaware. Um, the disease progresses in such a variable fashion it's always possible that one of their parents has the disease and simply doesn't know it. But with an individual without a family history, you really want to see a larger number of cysts in the kidneys to be confident of a diagnosis of hereditary PKD. In addition, you want to look at the liver. Um, if you see multiple cysts in the kidneys as well as a few cysts in the livers, that may increase your confidence of confirming a diagnosis. Um, Genetic testing is available. I think it's not used that often for uh, 
a variety of reasons. One, it's relatively expensive compared to imaging. Um, two, it's not always informative. Um, y you may do uh, genetic sequencing of the PKD1 and PKT2 genes, and there will invariably be, you know, variations in the genetic sequence, some of which may have no clinical s significance at all. Um, your likelihood of um, getting informative information is increased if you've got several family members and you can do genetic sequencing on those family members. Um, so it's not always informative and it's not always necessary. I mean, typically you can confirm a diagnosis with a good clinical history, including a family history and appropriate imaging. Um, so as I say, you know, most of the patients I see, um, there's already a, already a strong suspicion simply because they've already seen other physicians. So, you know, my clinical practice may not be typical. But for, you know, a, a, a typical practitioner, um, imaging either SONO or, CT, C, or MRI is really the imaging modality of choice. Um, SONO is more readily available. Um, it's available in essentially any, you know, hospital in the country. Um, and it's cheaper. So, you know, whether you use SONO or MRI may also, um, the choice of imaging modality may um, in, in some ways be a function of what's readily available and to some extent exp exp expense. And as I say, in, in my practice, um, I, uh, I typically try and obtain an MRI because um, it really gives better quality imaging um, and in the case of liver cysts, um, you're more likely to see a liver cyst with better quality, quality imaging. Um, it's probably worth noting that the liver cysts typically are of limited clinical consequence. You can sometimes see fairly extensive liver cysts that make people uncomfortable because of the size of the liver, but almost never does the liver become functionally abnormal. So those are the main ways that that I address the issue of making a diagnosis. Um, imaging is really um, the, the best way to go about it, and that in, in, con in conjunction with a family history will usually allow you uh, to confirm or refute a diagnosis. Um, Dr. Kelly, what other conditions are in your differential when making this diagnosis? Um, you know, as I said a moment ago, I think the main differential is simple renal cysts. There are other conditions in which you can see cysts in the kidneys, um, but most of those are extremely rare. Um, many, a, a variety of them are recessive, and so they're going to be relatively rare conditions. There are a variety of other genetic conditions that can cause cysts in the kidneys, but really the main thing you're trying to dis dis distinguish is a hereditary disease, particularly uh, autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, from someone who has simple renal cysts. You know, in a, in a younger individual, you might be concerned about something like autosomal recessive disease, but that diagnosis is usually made in childhood or the teenage years. You know, I'm an adult nephrologist. You know, I will occasionally see patients with autosomal recessive disease but it would be unusual for me to be making that diagnosis. That diagnosis is usually made by pediatricians. And, and that really has a, a, a different clinical appearance. Um, the kidneys typically don't get all that large. The cysts are primarily in the, in the medulla, um, not the cortex. And you don't see cysts in the liver in autosomal recessive disease. With autosomal recessive disease, you'll see periportal fibrosis and cirrhosis. And so it really has a very different you know, imaging uh, characteristic. Um, and as I say, it would be unusual for me to be making a diagnosis of autosomal recessive disease simply because that's usually made by the pediatricians. So at least for an adult nephrologist, the main thing you're trying to distinguish is between a hereditary disease, primarily autosomal dominant PKD, from simple renal cysts. Now, when a patient comes to you into the office, are they usually referred by family practice physicians or the ER? How do they come to you? Um, it's, uh, it's relatively unusual for these people to come from the emergency room. I mean, that could occasionally happen. Usually they come uh, 
from another practitioner, either a primary care physician or sometimes another nephrologist, especially with the advent of specific therapy for PKD, because not all nephrologists um, have interest and expertise in current therapies for PKD. Um, it, a not insignificant number of these patients actually are self-referred. Um, you know, they're, you know, have seen either a primary care physician or a nephrologist. They know they have a family history. Um, they may have already had some imaging and have been given a diagnosis, and they seek out um, someone with more interest and expertise in PKD to learn more. And so in my practice, and I think this is somewhat atypical, but in my practice, uh, a significant number of patients self-refer or are sometimes referred by a family member who I've seen. And lastly, what are some of the signs and symptoms the patient may present with? Is there anything specific you look for upon physical exam that will better lead you toward a diagnosis of polycystic kidney disease? In terms of signs and symptoms, it, it can run the gamut. I mean, some of these people are completely asymptomatic. Some of them will have had pain. Some of them will have had, you know, bleeding. Um, if they bleed into a cyst that's in continuity with the tubule, you know, you will see blood in the urine. Um, sometimes when they bleed into a cyst that's not in continuity with the tubule, it'll cause pain because they tamponade. Some of them will have had infections in their, either in their urine or in their kidneys. Some of them will have had kidney stones. There's a sort of a whole variety of, of signs and symptoms. Um, obviously, some of them will have had, uh, well, m almost all of them will have had some sort of assessment of their renal function, um, at a minimum, some serum chemistries, and some of them know they have renal dysfunction already. Um, in terms of physical findings, um, you know, when the kidneys are large enough, you can obviously palpate the kidneys. The liver may be enlarged if they have liver cysts. They may have uh, flank tenderness um, related to their, peak, to their cystic kidneys. So there are a whole variety of signs and symptoms they'll have. I want to thank Dr. Ben Cowley for joining us today. That was a great discussion on how the diagnosis of polycystic kidney disease is made. Thanks for tuning in, and we hope you enjoyed the discussion. We will see you next time here on NEPHEW.